This week in the AWS Developers Podcast, we are talking about the intersection of two different domains that are not so different or that might be merged. We're going to explain that. It's domain-driven design on one side and cloud automation on the other side. Stay tuned. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are on this planet. Thank you for listening for the AWS Developers Podcast every Friday morning in all your uh, podcasting applications, Deezer, Spotify, on YouTube, on Apple Podcasts and many others. This week, I have the, the honor, the privilege to uh, welcome uh, Gregor. Gregor Hope, you're uh, the author of multiple books, um, but a series called The Software Architect Elevator. I, I think I first saw your name um, at the beginning of this century, or close to that, when I was working in the uh, enterprise service bus world with Tipco. And, and you wrote a book that was um, a bit of... It helped me to organize my thought, and uh, that book was the enterprise integration patterns, designing, building, and deploying messaging solution. If I remember well, it was like more than 60 different enterprise application patterns. At that time, I was really much into patterns. Uh, I read Martin Fowler's books, and the one before, the Gang of Four, and then yours. <laughs> but that's how I, I, I came uh, uh, to know you. Uh, Gregor, thank you for, for being here. Um, You've written a lot about software architecture recently, and and you have a series of other books as well, uh, including the, the the software architect elevator. What are these books are about? So yeah, thanks for highlighting the enterprise integration patterns. <laughs> That's two thousand and three. We're almost embarrassed to say See, at the beginning of the century. Exactly twenty one <laughs> uh, years ago. And the funny thing about this is, you know, since I'm working a lot with serverless and cloud these days, those patterns actually like resurfacing and as popular as ever. But mm -hmm. one thing I always like to do coming to your question is looking at what we do as, as techies from different levels of abstraction, right? Sometimes I like to be extremely hands-on. Other times I like to sort of zoom out, I call it, and help us really better understand like why are we doing these things or you know, how should we think about the things. And that's where the architect elevator really comes from, right? It's like riding the elevator up and down to different levels. So what I do is apply that way of thinking to different domains. So cloud is a natural one, right? I have a lot to say about that. Mm -hmm. And then the most recent book is the platform strategy where, you know, all the customers we work with, yeah, they're always building a developer platform of some sorts. So I felt it's very useful to ride the elevator up and down to really better understand what makes a good um, developer platform. So that gives me the energy to, to write these books. So now it's three in a series, basically, the architect elevator, the cloud strategy, and the platform strategy. And they're not 20 years old. They come about sort of one every three, four years, I think it years. takes me to make models. <laughs> so hopefully I can keep up that cadence. You accelerate the, the cadence from, from the last year, every three years. Yeah. Well, um, and the links uh, to these books are in the podcast notes, so in your uh, favorite podcast app or on the website. You just scroll down a bit and you will find all, all, all the links. I recently read a blog post that you wrote like a year ago about domain-driven uh, design and how it fits into uh, cloud automation. And when I read your title, I was wondering, hmm, it's two different things. For me, it was my mental model, you know, it was two different boxes in my uh, mental model. Um, and, and you joined them and I found that super interesting and that's why I invite you to, to, to be here today and thank you for uh, accepting this invitation. So let, let's start with the basic. What is domain-driven model or design? Just really quickly, right? Since we talked about architect. <laughs> yeah, we can, we can write the, a book about it as well. <laughs> <laughs> that too, yeah. But what I, what I wanted to say is connecting the dots, I think, like you know, taking mm -hmm. two topics where you said, oh, I know both of these, but I never thought of them being closely related. I think that is one of the greatest maneuvers architects can do. It's like, hey, you can learn from this domain for your work in this seemingly other domain, but they have a hidden connection. So starting with DDD, now funnily, Eric Evans' Domain Driven Design book is almost exactly the same age as Enterprise Integration Patterns, so as the fall of 2003, right? And the subtitle of that book is, you know, tackling the complexity in the heart of software, if I'm not mistaken, right? Mm -hmm. So it's basically tackling right. complexity, right? So that is like, how do I better express my software so I as a person can deal with this complexity. So the main different design is as much of a sort of human exercise, right, to understand the domain and model the domain as much as it's a coding exercise, making the classes and the methods out of this. Mm 
Now, the interesting part is that when people talk about the complexity of the domain, right, that the book talks about, most people initially thought about the business domains, right? Because we're building mm -hmm. business software. And I think many of Eric's examples were like shipping, because it's like a real project. He used to work for some shipping company. That's where the examples come from. Say, how do I really understand yeah, what the shipping domain is like? And then the connecting the dots, right, that you hinted at was like our technical domains these days, like distributed runtime, serverless, queues, asynchronous, all of these kind of things. I found them to be sufficiently complex that tackling that complexity with domain-driven design seemed like a very interesting thing to do. And that's how the combination came about. In a nutshell, DDD is to start designing your software, not only in terms of um, algorithms and workflow and processes, but about the data model and think about what is the data model my application will work on. In the shipping example you mentioned, it would be, I don't know, a shipping order, a bill, a transportation notice, a custom clearance, something. These are all business uh, model. And, and that ties back also to um, uh, programming in your day-to-day -day activity. I'm programming today a lot of in, in Swift and in, in TypeScript. And I choose these language because they have a strong type model. And it's not like Python where everything is a string or roughly or can be anything and can change even in between two lines of code. Um, so how would you link types with domain design? Yeah, so there's two, there's sort of different camps in this world. So I would say mm -hmm. the first thing that you mentioned when you say, the domain driven, it makes a model. That's very true. But often the word we also use is a language. Like at the heart of that model is a language. Now, not a programming language, but a domain language, right? If you look at mm -hmm. Eric Evans' website, right, it's actually domainlanguage.org, right? The language part is very central to this, like having a vocabulary. Like in this case, you know, what's a container? What's a boat? What's a ship shipment? What's a bill of lading, right? That's like in the shipping domain. And if we go to the domain of distributed systems, we would use a very different language. So mm -hmm. I would go as far as saying, yeah, you can't do DDD if you don't have clarity on that language. You need to know the nouns and verbs you use, and you need to know what they mean. And that's a big part of the DDD work is to get to that point to like, you know, what is a container, right? Is that like that box, you know? It's a loaded container different than one. <laughs> exactly. Like, what, is it on the ship? Is it loaded? Sometimes it's in between. Sometimes it falls overboard, right? Like all that stuff, like that is part of DDD. Now, once you've done this, I think you have a couple of choices. Now you need to bring that language that you define into the system programming model, right? Now you want to code to that language, right? And that's where some people prefer that to do through the type system. Now, other people make entire domain-specific languages like DSLs is another DSL. commonly used word there. And the DSL can be object-oriented or maybe doesn't even have to be, right? I would say that is a choice you have. Like I've done a lot of work in Python and actually, and I like this quite a bit, right? And it supports classes and other things, but I would disassociate these a little bit, right? You got to have the language as a domain language, but then you have a choice, right? Maybe that's your preference even, you can cast that language into a strongly typed system like I do with TypeScript, mm -hmm. and I like that a lot. But I would say if somebody does something similar with Python, right, like Jupyter Notebooks or something, it has a clearly a domain language of all the graphs and the visualizations, right? And that works really well. So there, I think we, we want to be, be careful not to get stuck in the religious, you know, you know dynamically typed, <laughs> statically typed. I think they're all equally good as long as they properly represent this domain language that helps you as a person tackle the complexity in the heart of software, right? Because that's where we're coming from. So, so we're moving from um, a language to model the business to a language to model the infrastructure. That's the idea? So for my blog post, yes, I just to make sure we give some context there, right? Basically, mm -hmm. my premise was that DDD is great, right? And that's why there's events around DDD and books and workshops, right? So that worked well for us. But we always looked at the business side of domains, like the shipping container thing, right? And basically, my connecting the dots exercise was, hmm, maybe we can utilize some of this when we look at the infrastructure, or let's say cloud runtimes, right? Which may or may not be all infrastructure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
specifically, I, mean, I live in serverless land, so to speak. So when I talk about cloud and cloud runtime, see, I see queues, I see event brokers, I see functions that run, I see push models and pull models and timeouts and retries and back pressure and at least once delivery or exactly once delivery, people see. So I see a very rich language there, but most of the time that language is somewhere in the documentation. It's like, I need to go read up kind of things. Here's how this really works. So my thought is, one is get clarity on that language, right? So not have it loosey-goosey in the docs, but really like, hey, if something is push or pull, like we know what that means. And then as a second step, can I now bring that domain language into my cloud automation programming model? Those are the two I would say like the two pieces of where I wanted to go with that with that blog post. But that's the job of the architect. I mean, um, to on one side you mention um, services in the case of AWS, let's say SQS for Q, SNS for uh, publish subscribe. So the first one is pound to pound communication. The second is publish and subscribe yes. one to many. Um, is it the, the job of the architect? I think the answer is yes, but <laughs> let you elaborate. To, to map um, a, a business program, I need to notify all my uh, recipient uh, that that event happened to to a set of services that I can use to actually implement that 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 business. So uh, if I have a pound to pound notification, I will map that to SQS. If I have a want to many publish, publish subscribe type of things, I will map that to, to SNS. That's what you're trying to do there. Uh, and I have, I have strong opinions on this. And even then, mm -hmm. reinvent on stage, I've spoken to this. Like, yes, architects mm -hmm. do this. But I always told people, the list of services you use are not your architecture. And I think that's a mistake people commonly make. That's the bill of materials. That's sort of the ultimate implementation. But you're skipping a very, very important step then is what is like the design or the trade-offs that you're making. And the example I often use, you know, event bridge. So let's say you plug the event bridge icon on, on that PowerPoint, right? Mm -hmm. And he's like, hey, here's my service. Why did you use event bridge and what did you use it for? And I have a slide in my talks on this where I'm saying you could be interested in message filtering, right? You have too many messages, not all are relevant. You just filter out. Um, you can do a recipient list where you want to pass the message to multiple recipients. You can transform the message also, right? There's very different things you can achieve. So what's important to me is give people the vocabulary to express the intent. Like I wanted to do something and I wanted to have a language to properly express that intent. And I say, oh, it's a message filter. It's a message translator. It's a recipient list. That is my key architecture element. And I understand the trade-offs associated with these things. Mm -hmm. And then once I'm happy with those decisions, then I map that to like EventBridge or in another An cloud to, to mm -hmm. another kind of service. And finally, that talk is actually, or that analogy comes out of a talk about locking and avoiding lock-in, where I'm basically saying, if you maintain mental clarity on what you actually wanted to achieve, if you ever need to migrate somewhere else, that is much easier because you don't need to reverse engineer. Like, hey, I wanted to make a message translator, and that might be a certain service as an, in another cloud versus a recipient list might be something else. And if you, all you have is the icon, you actually have a much harder time taking it somewhere else. So basically my message was, it helps you as an architect gain clarity on the decisions that you're making. And if you're worried about you know, lock-in or multi-cloud, whatever it might be, it actually also gives you a better starting point. So finally, this came out of a talk about thinking about lock-in. But the key element is the icon isn't your architecture. Your architecture decisions happen before you pick the icon. But that's back to your enterprise integration patterns. No, that that's exactly what you describe in 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 that book. So we are we are back like twenty years before. Yes, and yes and no. So yeah, um, there's two reasons why it's back to enterprise integration pattern. The one thing is it's easy for me to make the examples because it's stuff that I have and it's in my in my head. So when I pick examples, I pick examples like this recipient list, translators, filters, mm -hmm. right? Because that is in my head. But it's also true that this is very much coming back because serverless solutions are asynchronous. 
they're event driven, they're fine grained. So the book is about message asynchronous messaging solutions. So the kind of applications we build on the cloud very much are asynchronous messaging solutions. So it's not just me, but the the, the topic space very much comes back. But there's an important so advo- oh, sorry, there's an important footnote to this, and that is the example I gave just earlier when I talked about language and distributed system, that is slightly different than the patterns, right? I talked about things like push versus pull and retries, time to live, back pressure, right? Those words are used. They are not in enterprise integration patterns. Like the, the vocabulary of enterprise integration patterns is channel, message mm-hmm. translator, aggregator, scatter gather, right? And that is for a very specific reason. And that is the integration patterns very much focus on the data flow. Like where does the message go? Does it go to one place? Does it go to multiple places? Does it get translated? Do I take some fields out? Do I take some messages out? Right, it's all data flow. What that pattern language doesn't cover as much is the control flow, like retries. Yeah, there's no enterprise integration pattern for retry. Back pressure, very common pattern, right? It's not an mm-hmm. enterprise integration patterns because, the, and this comes out of the DDD, like, um, a good domain has a boundary, right? And if you try to make a domain model for the whole world, you'll probably never get done. Um, we know some people who used to try to make these enterprise data models in the old days, and they were impressive by sheer surface area, like how many square meters, but they never did mm-hmm. anything useful. So any good domain, we need to put a boundary around. So enterprise integration patterns really puts the boundary around the message flow for me data flow message content, but it doesn't talk about these control flow mechanics. Now with serverless in the cloud, these are really coming to the foreground, like rate limiting, deadline IQ, throttling, retries, push versus pull, right? That is where your operational model sits. And it turns out we really don't have a language. So you would need enterprise integration patterns for control flow, right? That's really what, what this is about. And what, what is the language for these? Um, is it an English-based or text-based description of, of the pattern? Is it like new icons? Is it a combination of that? I mean, practically, what, what are we? Com- what, what, what is the tool that an um, um, architect can can use and manipulate to to express and exchange about these concepts? So, so I think it's at least three things and maybe more. Mm-hmm. Right? The first one is really getting the language, the domain language, getting clarity on the vocabulary. What is a right? retry? What right. is a, a pressure. Um, an exponential back off and things like that? Uh, exactly. Exponential back off. So back off is part of a retry. Jitter is part mm-hmm. of a retry. We know all these things. You talk to somebody who's gotten burned by building these kind of scalable systems usually, right? They thought, oh, exponential backoff is great until they realize all clients have the same backoff and it's just a giant disaster. And then what do you do? Well, you do jitter, right? So in many cases, we have the words, but we don't have the structure of the language. So basically the jitter is something related to retry and retry is something related to error handling, right? So in our heads, we all know this because we experience architects, but we don't have a really good structure. So sorting that out, step number one. Um, Mm -hmm. Step number two, where actually I have some very interesting work, thanks to a friend of mine who like 10 years ago realized that integration patterns was all data flow and missing control flow. And then he basically donated an augmentation to the icons. These um, I had a talk like at the summit set in, in reInvent about advanced integration patterns where I show where push versus pull is represented as a little nose or a little nook on the green rectangle integration pattern icons. So they either push or they pull. Doesn't have things said like traffic shaping and retry, but at least you know which way the con- where the active threat is. Is this an agent? Is this a passive component? And so we have a visual notation for some of it. And then the third one, of course, is your hint today is like, ooh, what if this could be in my type model? Right? What this could be in my mm-hmm. in my language. But I that's think the, that's the implementation uh, um, detail or translating that to an actual implementation. I'd like to go back to your uh, uh, graphical representation with a pull or nose. Um, that's a visual clue that a component should behave in a, in a, in a certain way. So what, what you're saying, or what I understand at least, is that the um, AWS architecture icon, icon are really great to make great PowerPoint, but they are not 
expressing uh, something about what the service can do and, and, and the direction of the flow. So you're proposing like a, a collection of graphical representation to model specific pattern. I don't know how to say, how to use a better word, <laughs> patterns for asynchronous application. So in a way, yes. And, and funny, it's actually a good friend mm -hmm. of mine, Jackie Reed. She wrote a book, Communication Patterns. She's pretty outspoken sort of um, with her words of caution, let's say, nicely against the cloud vendor icons. I mean, not just us, right? Whether they're rectangular or hexagons or whichever brand you follow, right? By being careful, right? They're cute, but they're not expressive for design decisions. So that, to your question, yes. Now, here comes the interesting thing where both type systems as well as the little noses um, come into play. And that is... When I build a system like this, I have certain constraints. So I'll give you yeah, out of our domain, right? Very easy example. Mm -hmm. So let's say I have DynamoDB. I want to make change data capture, right? We know that it's a DynamoDB stream, right? Because we both know a lot about this stuff. We instantly know that the DynamoDB stream is something you need to pull. Right? It's not active. It's not pushing anyway. It's different than an S3 event, let's say, right? So event pushes, right? DynamoDB stream, you have to pull, right? So basically, in a visual notation, that thing would have a little nook, right? Like it would have a little <laughs> hollow space so that when I want to connect something to this, I know that I need to pick something with a nose because otherwise it doesn't, you know, basically it's like two, Good like the male-female kind of thing, like a connector, right? <laughs> if I have a socket, I need a plug, right? And that would express the constraint very easily because you know, let's say you do this right now, you're new to all this, right? You have a DynamoDB stream, you say, oh, I have an event bridge bus and I have event bridge pipes. Which one should I use? Right? And then we often say, oh, that's a really great architecture decision. Of course, you and I know the answer to this, right? But the visual icon would make this, even if you don't know what's underneath, the visual icon would make you immediately make the right decision because the event bridge bus would have another notch, like another kind of look cut out. So it doesn't fit versus pipes can pull, it has the nose, it fits, right? So basically this constraint is now made visible to you because, you because you could go into another service and just put an ARN of something else. It's You made fun out of strings, so ARNs, strings, right? So, so you could just pluck the string of something else in and it will never do anything, right? It will not work at all. So having these constraints expressed as either visual, right? The little noses, you know, the male-female plug thing, or in the types system, right? Would avoid all these mistakes and keep you from having to read 20 pages of documentation because it's right in front of you. And whether it's, whether it's visual or type system, again, is I think gusto, right? Some people like one better than the other that's like statically typed or dynamically typed. I have my own preferences, but I'm not telling anybody that that is better than the other one. You're free to choose. But the key thing is make these constraints first class citizens, not in the documentation. And with that, make the round trip much, much shorter, right? If you're trying to connect the wrong service to the wrong data source, either your ID has a red underline or your visual thing has like the plug and the socket don't line up. So you cannot mm -hmm. correct. So immediately together. you know mm -hmm. you need to pick something else. And I would think that that really helps the developer experience because the round trips can be tricky. Like let's say you violated some of these control flow principles that are baked in. You know, testing a circuit of stuff is difficult. You end up looking at CloudWatch. Maybe it works at low volume. It doesn't work at high volume anymore. You're immediately in a very complicated runtime model, which makes debugging, which is great for runtime characteristic, it scales and whatever not, right? But for debugging, it's very tedious. So shifting that left the popular term, right? Shifting that left into your IDE, visually or textual, right? I think is really shortening the cycles and avoids a lot of a lot of headache for developers. So proposing a graphical language on on top of both the actual service implementation to help to to structure and to compose these different uh, components right. together. Is this model or language already exist or is it something to do? What is the status now in mid twenty twenty four? So there's, I'm obviously not the only person thinking about this because the pain point kind of people quickly kind of stumble on. So I would say there's a there's a handful of approaches, right? There's like open source projects. I would say, quite honestly, things like Dapper, right, are aiming roughly a similar direction. They want to have a better language of what's a queue, what's a pub sub, right, and have a programming model that is much more at this level. So I would say that's one camp, and I have 
good friends there who always keep me honest because <laughs> I'm, I'm not as hands-on in that as, as I am others. The other one is the infra from code, right? Yeah, these are like the dark laying and wing layings kind of the world who are really saying we need a simpler programming model and the simpler programming model hinges on that domain language, right? If you want it to be simpler, you need to have a good language to express it. And I choose the third path. And what is, what if we don't make a new language like the infra from code guys largely do, but what if we build on top of CDK? Can I make CDK programming look the way I want? So I have a type system for push versus pull. I can use patterns. I can use a fluent API where I can basically say, take this data source, filter the messages, transform the messages, have a recipient list, right? Send this to like the following three kind of things. And I can do this literally writing sort of three lines of codes, hitting the dot, right? And the dot tells me, oh, the next thing that you can do here is, is X, Y, that. So that's what, what I started working on. Let, let, let me try to, to right. summarize that. So you say hooking that into the CDK. So CDK is Cloud uh, Development Kit. It's that um, set of library uh, available in multiple programming language, Python, TypeScript, okay. Java, C Sharp, I think as well, maybe others. Yeah, uh, that. Mm -hmm. that that allows you to write infrastructure as code, but instead of having YAML or JSON, you have real Java or Python code, so you can loop, you can make a heap, and most importantly, you can create create abstraction like classes for um, higher level construct as we call them in, in the CDK. For example, if you want to deploy a, uh, an ECS cluster with a load balancer, there is an object for that and you just type new ECS cluster with load balancer in two lines of code and it generates everything for you. So that's the CDK. And what you're saying is bring your uh, domain model, model, model or domain language into the, the CDK. So in my imagination, I see like a type for something that can be push and a type for something that can be pull and then APIs, primitives, that can take this parameter in, and, and because of the type system of the language itself, it would be impossible to push something that needs to be pulled because the, the, the type system will make the compiler um, generate errors. The, did I understand correctly what, what, you, what you mean? And I've shown code like this. Actually, at last reInvent, there was funnily it ended up in the German language track because the other tracks were full. So I gave something called architecture as code and I wrote a related blog post, which is called architecture as code. And it does exactly that. There's one critical, well, there's two critical components to making this work, right? The one is again, what is the vocabulary you use? Because by default, mm -hmm. CDK mirrors the service vocabulary, which yep. we said that is the end result, but that's not the language that you as an architect want to think in. So elevating the language to message filter, push, pull, those kind of things, right? That's one part of it. But there's another important part of it, and that is CDK is still very much hierarchy, resource hierarchy oriented, because that's where all the cloud automation languages originally come from, right? It's like mm -hmm. basically I have a v VPC and inside I have an availability zone, inside I have a VPC, inside I have an autoscaler group and inside I have an EC2 instance. And I mean, it's funny, I posted recently on LinkedIn, it's from the, coincidentally from the Sir Jackie's book also, where she had a picture, this was Azure, Azure but it was basically like, like, like Matryoshka dolls, right? It was like eight levels nested diagram because that's how classic infrastructure as code looks like. You have a component and it's contained in something else, contained in something else. Most of which, what we just talked about without highlighting it, but we talked about data and control flow, right? Push versus pull, change mm -hmm. data capture, routing of patterns. Dynamic. Correct. We, we, we are not describing a static infrastructure. We are describing a flow of data inside the system. Correct. And maybe the word, I haven't thought about this, but maybe the word infrastructure gives us a hint because it ends on structure. Like, and you just said, we're not that interested in the <laughs> static structure. We're interested in mm -hmm. dynamic behavior. So that is the other part of it. Basically, you need to turn this thing on its side, right? So rather than saying, here's all the resources I have, and then somehow I wire them together, you say, no, no, the wiring is the interesting part. What goes from where to where and what happens along the way? And then the resources follow from that. So you turn this whole thing on its side, and that also makes a very different programming model. Like in my case, I chose a fluent API, just like you said, right? You hit the mm -hmm. dot, right? If it's a push, only things come that can push. And if it's a pull, only things they have. But basically the dot means my programming model is not a resource hierarchy, but it's a flow. It's a chain of logical constructs. 
And then I have the infrastructure, basically what I call cloud compiler. My compiler deals with all the translations. So give you a simple example, like EventBridge pipes can call a Lambda function, right? The so-called enrichment step, but it can do anything mm-hmm. at once in the end. It doesn't have to enrich, but it can only call one. So why should I deal with this as a programmer, right? So in my prototype, what I did is, so let's say you want to read, let's say DynamoDB uh, stream, right? So I want to pull from that, right? So it's a pulling operation. So we know that needs pipes, but then I want to massage that message. I want to filter, transform, yada, yada. So let's say I have two things I want to do. I want to filter and then I want to, to transform. Well, in pipes, that may not work because you only have one Lambda function that you can call. So what my cloud compiler does is it knows the constraint. So if you have more than one operation, it puts an express workflow, step functions, express, express workflow in, and that workflow calls two Lambda functions in a row, right? Because you have two or three or four steps, right? Mm-hmm. If you remove the extra steps and you go back to one step, the workflow disappears and it just calls the Lambda function directly from pipes now. And my take is talk about cognitive load, talk about me as a programmer. Why do I have to deal as an architect? Why do I have to deal with this, right? The compiler should deal with this, right? It's just like my Java compiler figures out how many registers the thing has and put things in the right register and what I can. I, I rarely ever think about it, right? Because the compiler knows the runtime constraints versus as a developer, I want to express my intent. I want to add two numbers, and whether that is a stack machine or a register machine underneath, the compiler is great at sorting this out and whether it inlines my methods or does other optimizations, hey, I can't be bothered. And that's basically behind this, right? Can I elevate the programming model to the point where it mimics the way I think about it versus the way the machine executes it? Basically, get me out of assembly language and get me into a higher level language. That is probably a good way to describe it. Higher level so language want- needs to have a domain and that goes back to our starting point, right? We need that language to... Yeah, the domain language to do that. So you want your CDK compiler in this example to take decision about the infrastructure, I mean the cloud infrastructure. Do I implement that as a yes. step function or an, as an even bridge pipe? Just like you, you, I'm repeating what you said, I know, but it's to fix <laughs> this into my mind. Uh, just like a compiler today takes a decision, should I implement that as a register or as a, a, a stack variable or a heap variable? But here we, we're bringing that to, to cloud infrastructure. Wow. And do you think it's possible with the CDK? I, I mean, you, you said something. The CDK is coming from um, infrastructure, infrastructure as code. It's coming from cloud formation, basically, where we think in terms of networking and storage of, um, can we express this behavior in an infrastructure-based language? Because at the end, that's what the CDK does. So very interesting question. There's a funny, a fun fact to this, right? There's some interesting nuances here. So Ilad, you know, who is one of the key people in starting the CDK, basically believes no, And that's why he went off and started his own company and made a new language. Now, ironically, I believe, yes, or let's say at least be interested in seeing how far I can get with it. Now, as always, if you want to take something further, an important maneuver you need to think about is, can I narrow the domain? Right? Basically, if I was trying to do this across all languages, across all services, I would be like, mm, nope. <laughs> not my lifetime and not my TypeScript skills for sure, right? Or maybe not at all. So what the maneuver that I played is like, okay, let me put some other constraints in, which to me are just acceptable constraints. Let's say I only do TypeScript to start with. It's like mm-hmm. more than two thirds of CDK code is written in TypeScript already, so I'm not losing anyway. a lot. The mm-hmm. rest is Python, and then the rest rest is like one percent, right? Um, doesn't mean it's unimportant, but like you know, so two thirds of the people, or three quarters almost of the people, I have mm-hmm. in TypeScript, and I picked only serverless and careful with the word serverless. I only picked really Lambda, EventBridge, step functions, like the 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 sort of fast EDA flavor of service. I made my domain much smaller and I picked only one language. And then it turned out I could actually do this pretty nicely. Now, the funny thing was at the time I shared like an internal presentation and a relatively senior person on the team says, oh, CDK can't do that. I'm like, well, this is running code. <laughs> so it bends people's <laughs> minds a little bit, right? This is running CDK code. I'm like, no, you, yeah, let me open the console here, right? So it bends people's minds a little bit because it looks very different. But 
I'm yes, positive thing. enough that I have some at least initial successes because TypeScript is very powerful in the type model that you can make. Basically, the big change on turn, like basically where I took a different turn than most people is the higher level constructs are abstractions, but they follow the hierarchical model. They're basically saying, mm -hmm. oh, like I pick a higher node in the tree if you wish, right? And I give that a name, like the load balance, the, what is it, the uh, load balance bar? Yeah, load balancer, ECS, something. Correct, mm -hmm. right? But it's a higher element in the node, where as the different term that I take is like, I don't want that tree. I turn that whole thing sideways. I want the flow, right? And that is the big difference. I think that bends people's noodles a little bit, noodle a little bit, where like, oh, it, can you actually do this? And the short answer is, you totally can because I'm turning the thing sideways, but TypeScript only for now, right? It's not generated from cloud formation at all. It's all hand built, right? Very carefully and in a relatively narrow domain. So I have DynamoDB, for example, in my domain model, but it's not called NoSQL database, but it's used purely for enrichment. So I can say, enrich this message from this data source, and the data source happens to be a dynamo be. table, but my interface in that data source is super simple. It's an ARN, it's a key, and a path to the fields that I want to get, basically. And that's it. I don't have any of the other DynamoDB parameters because in my domain, they're not relevant because I'm not updating anything. I don't have concurrency issues, right? I don't have other things. It's purely fetch this field and put it in the message. That's kind of the beauty where as you build a higher level language, the interfaces become simpler. So if you want to make this, I would say my triumphant moment in the internal demos that I made was, so I wrote this CDK code and it's running CDK code, like a compiled CDK cloud formation deploys and runs. That same code can easily run locally as application code. So it's automation code and application code at the same time. You can really not tell which one it is. You swap out the libraries and suddenly this executes locally. It's TypeScript, right? So instead of a DynamoDB, you give it a JSON document, right? Because you need to mock it out somewhere. Here's a JSON document. And basically, I don't need to build a whole local stack, right? There's great community trying to, you know, building a local stack. Well, my local stack is trivial because all I need to do is I don't need to make a DynamoDB. All I need to make an implementation of storage. an interface, which mm -hmm. is like, here's a key and here's a path. Get me that element for that key, which is basically like JSON, but like it's like a one-liner JSON path, right? So mm -hmm. if you raise the level of abstraction, things like running locally or writing tests more easily becomes much, much easier because your surface area mm -hmm. goes down dramatically. That's what got you me can... excited. I always say that's sort of the moment where I tell people, oh, you haven't seen anything yet? Watch this, right? And suddenly you just run the TypeScript code without any cloud, without any cloud formation, anything, and it just executes and you can do unit tests, whatever you like. And I'm like, oh. That, that's what I was about to say. That's the dream for unit testing and local development. Yeah. And often in trains and plane, we can do that offline. But when, when you implement your language in the CDK, you make architecture choice in terms of uh, mapping to service, configuration of this service, or uh, sub patterns to implement. So it's a very opinionated uh, framework. Is there a risk of of being too opinionated and, and, and not giving the flexibility that the developer would need or the architect would need to implement their specific um, use cases. Yeah, and it, it's interesting because developers generally love opinionated stuff. You know, take like Rails <laughs> or something, right? Oh, everybody loves Rails, it's highly opinionated. And yeah, you know, I mentioned I wrote a book about platform strategy. The funny thing is people love opinionated stuff, but they doesn't they don't love stuff that constrains them. Yep. But actually, opinions, <laughs> so it's a, it's but it's a, almost the same thing. It's exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's almost the same thing, but they either love or hate it. So what, what makes opinionated work, right? The one thing is the boundary of the domain you pick must be clear and meaningful. So basically, I, I mentioned Dapper before, right? And if you live in the Kubernetes sidecar Dapper world, right, that is also a lot of constraint in a way, but many people mm -hmm. live happily in that ecosystem, so that constraint doesn't harm them, and that's why Dapper is popular, right? So if I do a similar thing on AWS serverless, where again, many people live on this ecosystem, that opinion actually doesn't, you know, doesn't constrain people in, in, in any way. So I think that is a big part of it. And the second part of it is, I call this return on opinion. 
Well, basically, the reason Rails was popular because, yeah, and DHH is a very opinionated person. I always say the, the frameworks really reflect the, the personality of the original authors, right? You can see like Rails is just like DHH, like strong opinion, right? But if you follow his opinion, your life is pretty damn good, right? That's why <laughs> Rails was. So that's the return on opinion, right? When I said, okay, you know, I know I need to you know, agree with this person on some things, but if I do, my life gets like five X better. So that has to be has to be given. So I think those are the two things, scope and return on opinion. And that I think uh, it's worth looking at. I learned a new word with your return on opinion. I knew error. I will apply error <laughs> oh, when talking about things like Amplify. It's exactly the same for, for Amplify. Um, let, let's go back a bit. I, Go back to the, the graphical representation of the abstraction, the why we have an abstraction, a description of the, of the abstraction, and, and then we dove into um, the implementation with the CDK, but that ties us to AWS. Don't we have a chance at this abstraction graphical language definition level to create something which is multi-cloud that doesn't attach specifically to AWS, but also to, to Google, Azure, and the others? Very interesting point. And generally, yes, looking at more than one example helps you find better patterns and abstractions. Like in the old days, you said you grew up with a pattern, same here, right? And people always said you need to have at least three examples before you can call something a pattern, mm -hmm. right? So having multiple clouds definitely helps you. But there's also an opposite effect, right? So the things we talk about, like the control flow, like all the vocabulary, the back pressures and thingies, they're very implementation specific, right? They will be quite different. So like, for example, I know EventBridge has a queue inside, right? Not every event router needs to have a queue inside. And if we want to like sort of mini sidebar, right? If you read the documentation carefully, you know it has a queue because if you use EventBridge bus and your target is rate limited, like an, like an API endpoint, like an HTTP endpoint, right? My old joke is sending requests to a HTTP endpoint at the rate that the events arrive is not called integration, it's called denial of service attack, right? <laughs> so you need rate limiting. Mm -hmm. Well, how can an event router do rate limiting? Well, the events need to go somewhere, either back pressure or a queue. In the push model, you can back pressure because you don't know where it comes mm -hmm. from, right? So you need to have a queue. So it becomes, you know, again, we know this stuff. It becomes to us very quickly obvious it has a queue. And if you read the documentation very carefully, you know, somewhere three quarters down the page, it says, oh, be careful. If you have a high arrival rate and a limited resource, time to live will come hit you, right? Because your queue fills up, your events going to press. So it basically hints at it without really saying it, right? So coming back to your point is, so let's say Cloud B doesn't have a queue in the event router. The, the control flow vocabulary that we talk about is going to be very different. Like that one will not be able to do rate limiting because it doesn't have a queue. So maybe I explicitly choose a queue. I put like GCP pops up, right, which has a queue. Maybe I do that explicitly. But basically, if I raise the level across multiple clouds, yes, it helps me think about it a little bit better. And that's true. But I lose the authenticity. Right? I, I lose that expressiveness of, yeah, there's a queue in this thing and mm -hmm. you need to do time to live. You have traffic shaping versus the other one doesn't. So it becomes a little bit of a broad brush and I lose the authenticity. And my at least working assumption was that people who want to build operations centric, like scalable latency you know, aware things, they need that authenticity. Right, they want to yeah, be they need to yes. fully embrace the platform where they are deploying they, to, to get the latest they, benefits. They must, right? So they must have the time to live thing. They must know the CQ and event bridge. And they must, if they need back pressure, they must build that, right? You cannot say, I abstract this. So what you see is the trade-off. And you can observe this with the open source mm -hmm. projects. Very much is the open source projects who go cross cloud, they tend to be much more data flow. They go back to the enterprise integration patterns because that works perfectly at that level, but they tend to be very thin on things like push versus pull, traffic shaping, retries, time to lives, because the operational characteristics vary very much between the clouds. So that is the trade-off you're making. And I didn't want to compete with them. So I said, hey, I'll do something that just works for one cloud. You can make the same thing for another cloud. And mm -hmm. probably it uses the same vocabulary we still talk about push and pull and you know, traffic shaping time to live, yeah, whatever. But it 
expresses like the type system of what you can do with what will be slightly different. And I find that to be important if you want to have something that has the operational characteristics that you're really after. So I don't want to dilute. I want to actually quite the opposite. I don't want to dilute the operational expressiveness. I want to amplify it. I want to give you a stronger language to express the operational characteristics, not weaken them. And that is the big difference between the, the multi-cloud part versus a better domain for one specific cloud because it amplifies the operational aspect. So there is room for you for, to write another book on the subject that would be like a follow-up of enterprise integration patterns? Yeah, yes. And well, what is always better than writing a book is when somebody else writes a book. And M. Newman <laughs> is now writing a book on uh, oh. building resilient <laughs> distributed systems. Right? So I'm, I already started uh, injecting, polluting his brain and injecting <laughs> some things. Uh, Keith Morris is writing or almost finished writing the third edition of Infrastructure as Code. And yes, there will be a mention of architecture as code in there as well. So the, the easier way is instead of me writing a whole book, I, I inject some of my ideas to my friends who, who are already writing books. Architecture as code. That's a new acronym as well. I'm taking note of them. <laughs> Add yes. return on opinion and no architecture as Correct, code. That's, because... that's exactly what it is, actually. Describe really well um, this discussion. Uh, wh what's next? If, if someone that listens to this episode um, until the end, and I thank you for that, <laughs> is, is willing to dive more into, into that or to contribute, what a software architect slash cloud architect can do today? Uh, again, we are recording this mid-July 2024. What's next? So I think there's a couple of things, right? The one thing I want to encourage people to do this on their own. Like it doesn't mean reinventing the wheel, but have a really close thinking about your own technical domain and the vocabulary that should use. I think that every cloud architect should do. Like for example, change data capture might be something you guys talk about all the time. Well, why don't you have a CDK class called change data capture? Go make one, right? Or my other favorite example is you will have different data classifications, right? You will have data that's personally identifiable and one that's not. Mm -hmm. So if you have a DynamoDB, let's just say, well, why don't you have two classes? One is DDB with PII and one is DDB without PII. So that's stuff that you can do and you might be getting deeper in this domain without even really knowing it, right? These are two very simple examples, but they're a huge step ahead because now your type mm -hmm. system has change data capture and you can instantiate change data capture, right? Becomes an object, right? So that's something you should do. The other thing is, of course, I always invite people to follow me along, right? So architectelevator.com mm -hmm. is my website. So my next steps are, are a, a couple, right? The one thing is I want to get my hands more on the infra from code. So I understand the space a little bit better, like you know, the wing lang, et cetera. And then I want to go back to, to my examples and see how far I can push it. The vehicle I use is, comes back to your very opening statement, I always use the loan broker example from like 21 years ago, right? Where I made a simple distributed sample application. And basically what I will do is try to really change the automation for that to be a rich domain language. And I will post about this on architectelevator.com and enterpriseintegrationpatterns.com. So the funny, the funny part of it is I had kind of abandoned enterprise integration patterns, not abandoned, but I wasn't blogging so much on enterprise integration patterns. A comment had the 65 patterns, they were all good. And I shifted my focus to architecture. And then as life writes funny stories, I realized that my architecture thoughts That's are very amazing. much about integration patterns. <laughs> so now I'm blogging back again at enterpriseintegrationpatterns.com. So this is exactly at the intersection, but that's where you can follow along to see sort of where I'm headed with this. I would like to make this open source and a community effort, but I need to sort out my own thoughts a little bit and I'll I'll share them in, in those blog posts. How domain-driven design across the path of um, infrastructure as code or to, to create architecture uh, as code and that fascinating conversation between uh, programming language and typing system with a model and, and language to express not only a business model, but also a technical uh, model of patterns of communication. So architect um, architectelevator.com and enterpriseintegrationpatterns.com, this is where all listeners can, can join you. All the links are in the notes of this uh, 
uh, podcast. Gregor, thank you for this fascinating um, uh, conversation. Uh, Gregor Hope, you're the author of the Software Architect Elevator, the Enterprise Integration Patterns book as well, and a couple of others, Cloud Strategy, Platform Strategy. All the links are in the notes of this podcast. Thank you for having listened to this uh, episode until the end. Next week, we are going to talk about serverless, uh, the state of serverless in 2024. A few weeks ago, it was with AWS folks and, and the VP of Compute, um, serverless compute at AWS. Next week is with someone you know, uh, Gregor. It's uh, Jan, Jan Kui, which is uh, AWS uh, serverless hero as well. He will share his point of view uh, with, um, with, with the, the, the listeners of this <laughs> podcast, of the AWS Developers Podcast. Thank you for having listened to us until the end. And now go build. Thank you.